Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Connor Moran. I'm the director of the Wisconsin Book Festival, and I am delighted to be here um, this afternoon to feature Paula Ramos for uh, her first book, Finding Latinx. It actually comes out on Tuesday, um, so I only have a galley. I would normally have, you know, like a nice background um, with a with a fresh copy, but um, we're just two days out, so very exciting. We're joined Paula's in Phoenix, um, reporting on Latino Vote in Arizona, um, and we are also joined today by Angela Bautista um, from, to the best of our knowledge, on Wisconsin Public Radio. Thank you so much, Angela, for being here as well. Um, before we get started, uh, and we do have, uh, Paula is going to need to catch a plane, so we might not get to go the whole hour. I think we got 40 minutes, so I'll get out of the way. But I want to thank Madison Public Library and the Madison Public Library Foundation and all of our sponsors who have been so steadfast in making sure that we're able to bring free cultural events to people in Wisconsin. And now, as we do digital events um, across the country and throughout the world, so um, thank you to all of them. Um, I will stop now and hand it over to Angela and Paula. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, thank you, Paula, for being here with me in thank you for having the me. kitchen and <laughs> your airport lounge. Um, Literally, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so um, your book, Finding Latinx in Search of the Voices, Redefining Latino Identity. Um, I approached this book I, with what I thought I thought I understood what Latinx meant. And I think people will approach this book um, with some familiarity of the term. We're seeing it more and more now, even in the news. Um, what was it like for you to first hear the term Latinx? So I first heard it and I didn't know what it meant, but I, but I know that it felt better, right? And so I think that's sort of like my, that was my introduction with the word. Um, and with this like language where the word just sort of like, just felt better and felt more like me. And I didn't really understand what it meant. And so that was my first introduction. I think that's kind of the like beauty of this world that a lot of people, I think particularly since like 2016, right? When the word was all of a sudden popping up like more around the internet, more around like activist circles, um, random circles, and then people were just using it, right? And I remember having so many conversations and we were all like, what does it mean? We don't know, and just we kept using it, right? And I think that's that's kind of like the beginning of the story of this word, that it starts to embrace, make people feel more included without truly knowing why, you know? And then we can get into like what the word means for different people, but I think that's like the beginning of the story, that it, the, the word feels better for a lot of people that for many years haven't felt included. Right, and you write about coming out as Latinx. What, what do you mean by that, coming out? Um, I feel like I, you know, I, I grew up in, 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 men, in different cities and um, I feel like I grew up wearing different hats. You know? So I was born in Miami um, to a Mexican father and a Cuban mother. Um, and then when I was younger, when I was like about two years old, I moved to Spain, my parents separated. Um, and so when I was in Spain, I remember feeling Latina in Spain, right? And then when I would go to the US, I remember feeling, um, you know, sometimes more Mexican, others more Cuban, but then also, you know, I had this childhood in Spain. And then growing up, um, my father, both of my parents work in Hispanic media, no? And so I grew up, you know, watching these very traditional images of what Latinos looked like, whether that was in my dad's newscast or in the telenovelas that I grew up with. And I would, I would look at that and I didn't, I didn't really see myself, no? And then I would go to Mexico and I would be with my entire family there. And I felt 50% of that, but I also still didn't see myself and I didn't see myself in Cuban circles. And, and so I feel like, in a lot of these spaces at some points in my life, I had to wear different hats, no? I had to pretend to be more Latina according to their standards um, in this circle because I'm also queer. Um, you know, I had to choose to be Latino but not queer. And so I didn't feel like I could be all parts at once. Um, and so there was a moment after 2016 where I realized, you know, for so long in my different careers, you know, in politics or in storytelling with my family in Europe or in the US, I had to choose a little bit of something. And, and so, so I think that's why the term Latin Expo, right? Because I felt like when I'm talking to you and I'm identifying myself, you get the whole of me in that one word. Mm. So um, the way I understood Latinx coming into this book was that it was a sort of identifying label for yourself. But when you write about it, you write a lot about seeing things through a Latinx lens, that it's not just a way of identifying, but a way of 
seeing not only yourself, but other people, communities, issues? What does it mean to look through a Latinx lens? Yeah, um, so the first is understanding that the way that I see that X, right, is it's an invitation for anyone and everyone that has ever felt um, left out of the traditional Latino community, right? Um, you can be an Afro-Latino, queer Latino, trans Latino, indigenous Latino, you can be a Latino um, who has only learned to speak English their entire lives, no, and was once told that they weren't you know, Latino enough because they didn't speak Spanish. Um, that word is for you. You can be someone like my grandmother um, who was told that she deserved a certain amount of rights, but truly this entire time she she was yearning for more. No, that that is Latinx. And so to look at to look at us through a Latinx lens is to to look at all of us, right? Is to understand that I myself are have similar stories to the three million Afro Latinos that are here. No, it's to understand that there's 250,000 Latinos that also identify as Muslim. Um, it's to know that immigrants aren't just brown, no, that there's at least 4 million black immigrants in this country. And beyond that, it's to stop looking at us through like a one-dimensional immigration lens and understand all of the different intersectional issues that affect us, right? Whether that's criminal justice, whether that is climate change, um, whether that is race and, and all these different levels, um, but it's to sort of like break these stereotypes that many have created about us for all of these years is to start understanding all the different, the way that we've evolved you know, in the past 30, 40 years. Um, because I think, you know, part, part of the interesting thing of this word is that for so long, mainstream media had told our stories, you know, pollsters had told our stories. People looked at us in numbers, and I think we sort of lost track of like how we had changed in the past 30, 40 years, you no? Know? Um, and so all that Latinx does is to try and like take a look and understand like me, myself, Paola, what did I do, you know, in the past 20 years, right? Why did I feel, and how did I come out? Right? What are the different issues that affect me that are different from those that affect my, my parents? Mm. So you went in search of the voices that would represent Latinx and it took you all across the country. There was even a map in the book of like the traces where you went, you literally went all over the United States and found all these different voices. Um, and what I found connecting all of these different experiences and different people, indigenous people, Afro-Latinos, um, and so on, you named a bunch of examples. Um, a lot, I, I think the connective thread between them is stories of trauma, but also resilience. You know, trauma from, you know, um, the immigration system, systems that have neglected Afro-Latinos or abused, um, abused people, um, uh, histories of colonialism and racism, all these things. Um, how much does trauma inform Latinx identity and at what point does it stop defining it? I think a lot, no? Um, and I think one of the things that I'm noticing is that younger, the younger Latino generation isn't allowing, first of all, isn't allowing trauma to define themselves um, and is and, and believes that they deserve more than what has been given to them, right? And I learned that less, I mean, every single story in every single community that I was with, right, whether it was farm workers in the Central Valley of California, whether it was um, you know, the trans Latino community here in Arizona, whether it was ind indigenous folks in the South, um, artists, exactly where you are in Wisconsin, every single person had an initial story of trauma. Most of it of things that they had seen through their parents. But to me, the lesson, I have truly learned that lesson um, through, through young Latinos, particularly, so I, I think of um, people like Carlitos, right? So Carlitos was a student, um, he was in Parkland. Um, and, you know, he was obviously part of the day in which one, he lost one of his best friends um, in high school due to the shooting. Um, and he saw those images, right? Those are traumatic images of, of gun violence, no? And instead of accepting that reality, he went on to create his own organization to, to get younger Latinas to speak out about, about gun violence, right? So that's one example. Um, another example was when I was in El Paso and in Texas, the same thing, right? These are, these are folks that, that had been part of and witnessed a, a massive massacre. Um, and instead of keeping their head down, you know, and instead of accepting um, what other people told them, you know, that they didn't belong there, and they were trying getting out the vote in the 2018 midterms, right? And they, they recorded, they created a, a historic amount of, of, of youth mobilization and people went out to vote, right? Because they didn't allow the status quo to define them. And more than anything, um, I learned it a lot with like, I had a lot of conversations with young Latinas 
um, who suffer from depression and suffer from anxiety, um, you know, young Latinas that have seen their parents be criminalized, no? some undocumented, others live in mixed status families. And when their parents were told no, to not talk about mental health, no, to not talk about um, sadness, they didn't take that, no, and they, they, they're starting to talk about it openly, no, and so yes, there, there, is, there is trauma in a lot of these stories, but it's, it's incredible to see what young, what young people are doing about that, no, that they're speaking, and they can be broken, but they're choosing to, to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. I see in all the stories that you talk about, um, that you talk, or in all the people that you talk with, that there is this sort of moment of self-realization for each of these people in their own way sort of coming out. Not that they would ever use the term Latinx um, and you, um, it, the people you talk to, um, most of them actually don't use right. the term for themselves, but there is a sort of coming out moment um, in which they kind of come into their own identity, whether that's being uh, black or Muslim or no longer wanting to be defined by trauma. Um, th and there's something, there's something, hmm, what am I trying to say? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not gonna finish the sentence for you, but, but that, that's been sort of um, the, you know, the takeaway really is that people are now, it's happening now, people, particularly in a moment where, you know, you, you can agree with, with Trump or not, or you can be a Republican or a Democrat, but th this is a time where many people do feel some form of oppression, no? Many people do feel divided. And it is now, you know, that people are sort of like stepping into their identities, right? It is now that people are sort of like understanding like what it means to be them and, and, and it's happening right now. And that's why this term is so complex because we're just learning about that, right? It's, it, I, you always use this analogy of like, of like imagine, no, we, there's 60 million Latinos of us. Now imagine if we all step outside into the sun and you put a light on us, like here's what we look like. No, and that's sort of the metaphor of the book. No, here, I'm gonna put a, a like rays of light on us and here's what we look like. And so we're in that process of coming out ourselves. But I think the, the hard part is for other Latinos to like look around us and be like, oh wow, no, why did this person, you know, that immigrated like me from, from Mexico decide to choose Islam? No, what drove that person to do that and hundreds and thousands of other people? And you know, why why does an after Latina that forever was told that she wasn't Latina enough, like what does that experience mean for her? Why why did I spend so many years not seeing this person um, as one of me? Right, so I think those are the conversations we're having right now. Mm -hmm. You, um, in you know, traveling across the country, you talk a lot about geography and a sense of place, a sense of home, defining uh, who we are as people or mm -hmm. who Latinos are as people. Um, so, can we talk about that for you? You talk about growing up in the Miami bubble and mm -hmm. what it meant to leave, and what that yeah. taught you. What did that teach you? So, so part of, for me, the exercise of the book, right, was a meeting different people, but it was sort of like tackling geography in a different way, right? So it was like going to spaces that we believe aren't ours, right, or don't make Latinos and, and immigrants feel like home and, and looking at them from a different perspective, right? So that's, that was part of my, my like exercise in the Midwest. And in Miami or in Florida, the exercise was the reverse, no? Um, rediscovering a place that I thought I knew. And that was sort of my like focus there. And that was one of the most interesting conversations I had, right? Where the first thing I did when, when I like tackled Miami, um, I wanted to find different voices, but one of the first things I did is I hit up um, my, so for, for reference, for, for people that may be watching this, Miami is a bubble, right? Because more than 60% of like 70% um, of people in Miami identify as Latino. And so you grow up not identifying as Latino because everyone around you is, is right? And everyone around you has the immigrant story. And so Miami is a place that in a way allows you to forget where you come from, right? It allows you to forget that you are an immigrant because everyone else is like you. So the first thing I did when I got there is that I, I got in touch with a lot of my high school friends, right? And the question that I had for all of them was what happened to you when you left Miami? No, what happened to you when you went to the Midwest for college, when you went to the South, when you went to California? Like, what was that reaction like? That everyone had the same, the same experience, right? Where all of a sudden they were like, it was the first time that I experienced some form of racism, where it was the first time that I understood that like 
I am Latina, or it was the first time that I understood that my parents are immigrants, but it took leaving Miami for people to open their eyes, no? And so now the interesting thing for me was, okay, so once you have that experience and you come back to Miami, what does that mean, no? How, how are you changing? How are you changing a city that you thought you knew? And, and I think it's creating a little bit more empathy, right? I think what you see now in Miami and in Florida politics, right? When you, when you hear these stories of a lot of like, you know, the Cuban, extreme Cuban support for someone like President Trump. And a lot of that is because the older generation of Cubans have been able to forget where they come from, right? And so now you see this younger generation that left Miami came back and they're, they're instilling and, and injecting another sense of like empathy that I think Miami has lost. Mm. This is a part of your book that really profoundly affected me because of, um, I guess kind of where I come from and um, mm -hmm. my family sort of relationship to it. But uh, you talked with someone who you call basically your opposite, um, mm -hmm. Enrique, who is a black Cuban supporter of Trump, a member of the Proud Boys, yeah. identifies as a Western chauvinist, on paper, you would read him as someone that would identify um, on paper as not fitting that sort of ideology. Um, right. But when you look at him through a Latinx lens, I, you come away with more sympathy for where he's coming from and how he tries to define himself. Yes, right. So part of part of this conversation, right, is a understanding that just because you're Latina, just because you're after Latina, does not mean that you're a Democrat. No, it does not mean that you're a liberal. And I think that's important for people too, but including myself. No, it, it's just a good reminder of like that is also part of the conversation, and that's part of breaking stereotypes. The other part is 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 not letting our own biases get in the way, right? So with someone like Enrique, you're right. When I when I when I first read, you know, that there was an Afro Cuban and that was heading the Proud Boys, that was the chairman of the Proud Boys, I, I you know, my initial reaction was like, why? Like what what is that about? And then you understand, right, that someone like Enrique Tapio, who's who's black and Latino, is a person that has been neglected by both systems and by, by the system and by both parties, right? He is someone that at some point, neither Democrats nor Republicans took as theirs. And he's someone that was left out of the system. And Miami is a perfect example. Everyone was always campaigning in Miami, you know? And everyone's always like trying to reach the Latino vote. And so my question coming out of that was who was looking out for someone like Enrique when Enrique was growing up in Miami? And the answer that I took is no one, right? And so the interesting thing of Enrique is, is is that in Trump, right, he sees a proximity to white power. And at the end of the day, my take was that that is driven by this like deep desire to assimilate, right? To be part of something else. Again, you can agree or you can disagree, but it is driven, it, that, that is to me was like the, the core of why this person um, was, was aching so much to be part of something else. And so that was one takeaway. The other takeaway is that with someone like Enrique, you know, and when you, when, you, when you see it through a Latinx lens, we were able to have these conversations, right? Where we were able to like understand our differences, but we were, but I was, one of the things that I'm most proud of with him is that I was able to get him to understand, like, no matter how much you try, you still can erase the fact that you are an immigrant, right? And so when you're calling people legal aliens, understand, understand why you're saying that. And so now when I talk to Enrique, he'll say undocumented immigrants. And so it's, it is a small, it is a very small thing, but it, again, going back to words, words matter, no? And it is injecting a level of empathy and sympathy in something that perhaps wasn't there before. Mm. You mentioned assimilation and um, one of the many examples, I think, of ways in which I had, had not thought about ways to assimilate. Um, <laughs> so you went to Canton, Georgia um, to witness this, um, the, the local Mayan community and their memorial for 9-11, their 9-11 uh, memorial celebration. And they use 9-11, um, this memorial celebration as a way to assert themselves, That's right. both as Mayan and American. And I just thought this is such a beautiful portrait of not necessarily assimilating by rejecting oneself, but embracing oneself and your multiple identities. Yeah, I mean, when I first got the call and they were like, and I remember one of the leaders was like, I want you to see something that people don't see. I was like, all right. And he was like, come here during September 11th. 
And my initial reaction was like, is, is not the first thing that I would think of. And so that was it, right? I think the, the Mayan, the, there is just so people know, no, and this was all news to me. And there's a significant indigenous Maya community um, that for generations now has been, has been living in the South. And one of them is in, is in Canton, Georgia. Um, and so for them, they wanted to take September 11 as a way for other Americans to understand um, and to redefine what patriotism meant, right? Um, and for them, it was both like honoring the United States, right? And like honoring honoring what America has brought them, but it was also a way for them to say, the, what this country has allowed me is to hold on tight to my Mayan roots, right? It's to hold on tight to my indigenous language, is to hold on tight to my name tradition and to my culture. No, and that is the beauty of America. And like, I found that, you no, know, I found that symbolism in like the most unexpected of places in like Canton, Georgia. And so, you know, the, I met a lot of young Mayan kids who saw their parents fall back into silence. No, when people would talk to them, the, the parents would like try and either speak in Spanish or in English, but they would choose actively to not speak in their Maya language. So in Mamo and Conjolal, these are kids that saw their parents um, honestly just the, the silence to me was like a, a very like I learned a lot where like silence meant a lot in the Mayan community where like it was a way to like assimilate you know and put your head up down put your head down and, and not like look at people in the eyes and not like bring your whole self to these conversations in these spaces and the Mayan kids and have seen their parents grow up like that are rejecting that you no know? um, and so that's that's what I experienced in Canton it's these kids that in this small Georgian town in the midst of like kind of this like red sea um you know took over the like the like town um you know they had this like little town church and and they did a whole traditional like mayan um, um celebration on 9 11 and there were some like white folks in there um and i could see the reaction to it and people were like didn't really know how to react but they, i think the people that were there like found saw a different form of patriotism that they had ever that they had never seen yeah another example um of what different kinds of assimilation can look like you went to greenville south carolina where you went to a mayan catholic congregation in which they blend and preserve mayan spiritual practices with catholicism and it got me thinking you know as a filipino person i grew up catholic mm -hmm. like what would indigenous Filipino Catholicism looked like as right. a form of assimilation. I just thought that was fascinating. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things where I feel like if more people understood, like in just in, in this particular community, like the Maya community through like, you know, when we think of patriotism, a lot of like sp specifically now, no, a lot of people think about like religion, you no, know, and the love of God and like these like traditional values. And in a way, there is nothing more American than what I saw no, through through the Mayan community, right? Where they not only have like a relationship, um, a very unique relationship with God, but just a relationship with their environment. And that to me was like the biggest like takeaway from, from my experience embedding with them where like they value the land that they walk in. You know, they value the sun and they value conversations in a way that, that many of us take for granted. Um, and then you start thinking and it goes back to like, of course, like they, they, they are the first peoples. No, they, are, they, they were in the Americas before anyone does. And so they have a relationship with land and with geography that we may think is random, but for them it's like, and I, and, and I, and I always think about this, right? And I remember being like, you know, what, what, what does it feel like to be here? And they were like, it feels just like home. No, it feels just like being in Guatemala. No? And they remember one, one, of, one of the leaders was like, just look around you, you know, the trees. Um, and, and that is part of the history, right? And so what, what to us is random, to them, to them is familiar, to them is home, to them is their land. Mm -hmm. You travel to so many places uh, where you find communities that, are, uh, that you would not expect to be there. And when you ask the question, like, how did you end up here? Um, it kind of ends up becoming obvious. It's because, you know, they just made it their home. It's, yes, and it goes back to, um, I was thinking about it, it goes back to love, you know, you go with where you go with your loved ones are, you know, and th that's, that is the, the core of these migration patterns, you know, if, you're, if your loved one is in these cities, you no, know, or in these places, you go, um, and that, and you can be in Georgia, you can be in the Midwest, you can be in the border, um, and that is kind of this, like, unstoppable force, you no, know, and <laughs> putting politics aside though, like no wall and no policy will end that. No, if your loved ones are there and people make these places feel like home. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we've been talking about the South. Let's bring it to the Midwest. So you actually came to Wisconsin and to Madison. What did you find here? Yeah. Um, so and I, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to say that I hadn't been, I hadn't been to Wisconsin um, until I went there for the first time, um, through, through this book. And I have, I have since gone um, m- multiple times, and I've done some important advice. But again, my, my idea for this like Midwestern chapter um, was to make a place like the Midwest feel like home, right? And then truly understand that over the past decades, like the Latino population growth has, I mean, Latinos are growing in the Midwest and in the South, and I higher levels than they are in Florida. And, and so what I did there is I tried to I tried to guide myself through culture, right? And so it was through food, you know, and I wanted to see what people were doing with food. And then in Wisconsin, it was through music. And, and so what I found in Wisconsin was that there is this like, first of all, I didn't know that Wisconsin had the largest Latino music festival in the entire country, which was like all news to me. And I was like, that's interesting. And so from there, I like just started like figuring out like, what, what, what was that foundation and and I found that there's just like these incredible lat- young Latino musicians um that are like completely impacting culture and making a place like Wisconsin theirs no and so I spent some time in Milwaukee and with a like mariachi band in the south side of Milwaukee and I spent some time with two hip-hop artists two Latino hip-hop artists that also grew up in the south side but then instead of like holding on to traditional Latino music they're merging it with hip hop and with cumbia and electronic music. Um, I met a lot of like Latino DJs that same that are like, I don't want to be in the Latino circle. I want to do electronic music, right? And like European music. And so it was, um, it was amazing. And I think back of like the biggest thing I learned, particularly with Brown's crew, which is this like hip hop then crew in, in Milwaukee. And they, they, they kept saying, they're like, in order to know where you're going, you got to know where you come from, you know? And that's, that was a message throughout all of these different like musical themes that I found. Like music was a way to like get people rooted in where they were, where they're from, but then allow, allow that to give them the like creative freedom um, to be who they want to be. And I think music, music allows you to do that. No, in, in that music, no, in these music rooms with, with notes, you can, you can do whatever you want and you can feel however you want. And that was, it was amazing to watch. Mm-hmm. That was so surprising. I feel bad that I had missed the low stills when bad bunny and Omar came here. yeah Ugh, yeah and it just makes me so proud to think about um the sort of vibrancy that you can even find in the midwest um, yeah and, it, and i didn't i didn't know that i mean i and that 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 was on me and i feel like that was you know that's that's a lot of people's reactions are like wait what you're like you found all these like these amazing artists and and yeah and that was that was sort of like the theme of the Midwest, right? And, and Illinois, I wanted to drive myself through food in Wisconsin through music and in Iowa through religion and language. And so understanding how for generations, Latinos have made homes and, and felt people and, 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 and sorry, and, um, and a lot of people feel like home through their own culture. Mm-hmm. So um, I want to bring it now back, or uh, I want to bring it to politics again. Um, mm-hmm. It's not lost on us that we're in the middle of an election and you are you are just now coming back from a reporting trip. What are you seeing in the Latino community in regards to this election and the Latino vote? Um, I'll, I'll tell you just based on what I'm seeing here. So I'm, I'm in Arizona, right? Um, just for context, right? Arizona is a, is a place where um, President Trump won by less than 4% in 2016. Um, it's also a place that has not seen a Democrat, um, a presidential uh, Democratic nominee has not won the state of Arizona since 1996, right? And now all of a sudden you see that Joe Biden is sort of leading in the polls. All this to say that like Arizona is the battleground state right now. Um, and so there's this interesting dynamic that is happening where, um, you know, people know that Joe Biden is going to win the national Latino vote, but then all of a sudden, if you zoom in, you start to see this like gender divide between the way that Latinas are preferring Joe Biden and the way that Latinas are. So to give you an example, um, there's a poll that found that 40% of young Latino men in Arizona are intrigued by Trump and that they say that they might vote for Donald Trump, right? And so it goes back to what we were talking about like assimilation no? and like what, what does Trump um, offer to them? Um, and so that's the, there's this gender gap that is that is happening but the foundation is immigration, 
right? So I've talked to so many um, dreamers that watch their parents and be criminalized by like policies like in Joe Arpaio's of SB 1070 to show me your papers. And no matter where you look, you know, you can be for Trump or for Biden, like that legacy is lingering everywhere in this state, right? Where you have these like young people that grew up watching this, like grew up in this like anti-immigrant history. And so they're coming out to vote, right? Like they, that is driving their vote. Um, some people choose to forget about that and some people can't forget about that. And those are sort of like the two driving forces. Um, and I think every state has some form of that in play, no? But I, to me, like Arizona is a perfect like example of like what to expect across the country. Like Latinos will vote, um, but it's way more nuanced than we think, you know? And the, the, the undercurrent is it always goes back to history, you know? How have these young people, what have they grown up seeing among them? Mm -hmm. It's so easy to forget the sort of histories and stories when we talk about Latinos as a voting block or a voting demographic or just mm -hmm. um, as data points. Um, so I'm very- Yeah, and that's, that's the tendency, right? Like the tendency is, and that's an easier story, right? When the story is like, you know, Latinos will come to vote, no? Latinos will overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. Like, sure, that's like the 1% of the story, um, but there's so many like nuances and like, what does it mean to be a mixed status family? What does it mean to grow under Joe or Arpaio? What does it mean to be like a traditional Latino man that is scared of change, right? Um, and the problem is that there's not a lot of data out there, right? There's not enough research. There's, there hasn't ever been enough resources and money invested in understanding this block. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah. Um, so uh, you reported this out um, in a much different time than that we're living in right now, because you know otherwise we would be talking face to face on a stage somewhere. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing? Um, how are you seeing Latinos being affected by the coronavirus? And what does that uh, say for Latinx? Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, that that is the number one issue right now. You know, um, that I think a lot of Latinos are saying that this virus, like this election, has no longer become about politics. It's no uh, truly like it, it is no longer about like. Trump or Biden, it is for many of them, it is, it's, it's a matter of survival. No, it is a matter of like life and death. And it's simple, right? There's over 36,000 Latinos that have died. You look at May and the unemployment rate for Latinos was at 18%, right? And so a lot of the young people that perhaps at some point in their lives could sort of detach themselves from politics. Politics is not personal. Like, like po politics is is their lives right now and so these are a lot of you know young latinos that have seen their parents be affected that have seen their abuelos or tias and their you know their their parents pass away they have seen them become unemployed they have seen them be deemed as essential workers yet be treated differently and so that that is a driving force and, and so i mean again the, the the latinx lens is simply like understanding the intricacy and the intersectionality of like of all of these issues right and and i think I honestly think that is that is why that is one of the many reasons why the Latino vote is going to be like I, I believe that it's going to be one of the highest ones we've seen because the it, it, it's it is truly like a, a, a black and white choice at this point and you can't you can't for, going back to the trauma no you can't forget what you've seen and so there perhaps there was a moment where you could stay home but I think after what people are seeing they're not going to. Mm. Yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, in Wisconsin is, a, is an interesting example, right? Like, obviously, you know, the president won there by less than 1%. And if you look at like 2012 compared to 2016, Latino voter turnout decreased, right? And so it goes back to, um, you know, do people feel more seen now? You no, know, in this place, do Latinos feel more seen now in a place like Wisconsin? Um, have they talked about issues that go beyond immigration? You no, know, have campaigns spent enough time looking at the Midwest not through a Latino lens, but through like a winning lens, you know? like to, to win a place like Wisconsin, you do need those Latinos to turn out in a way that they did in 2016. So mm. we'll see. You think they're underestimating the Latino voting power? I think they've done a, I think they've done a way better job. Um, I, I do. Um, I think there's, there's so much more to be done. There's so many more lessons learned. I think everyone's learning. I think you have to not be scared of making mistakes. Um, you, you, you can't be scared of asking questions. I think a lot of this debate comes down to the most simple questions, you know, of like, of, of, of campaigns and politicians asking young Latinos, like, 
what is the agenda that you want to see? The other day I was, I was here in Arizona and I asked someone, I was like, has, has anyone ever asked you what change you want to see? And they're like, no. Right. So I think it, it goes back to the basics. Yeah. So um, we're reaching the end here. Uh, I want to ask you, and you know, um, it's hard to predict what's going to happen in the next three weeks. It's harder to predict what's going to happen in the next year or more. Um, but big picture, what do you hope for the future of Latinx? Um, I, I mean, I want, I want people, I mean, look, my, my biggest, um, what would make me really happy is to, for people to like read this book and, and, and start understanding their value, right? Because the only way people do vote, no, the only way people do run for office, the only people do ask for that pay check, you no, know, and that pay raise, is if, is if you believe that you are valuable, you no, know, and is if you see yourself, um, you, you, see, you see yourself in that lens, right? And that's why I go back to like, people are like, well, why Latinx? And I'm like, no one uses that word. And I'm like, because the way you talk about yourself is a reflection of how you see yourself in the world, right? And I feel like so far, a lot of these words have like limited us, you no, know, and have put us in boxes. And so I hope that this allows people to see beyond what has been given to us, you no? Know? Um, and I think we're already starting to see change. You know? All of a sudden in 2018, you had more Latinos running for office than ever before. You have now more Latinos running for office than ever before. You, know, you have people speaking up more than ever before. Um, and so I think it's, it's a wave, you know? and I just hope that that wave goes faster. You wrote such a beautiful portrait of this community and I am really looking forward to seeing the reaction and hopefully other people see themselves reflected, even people that aren't Latino, like myself, I even saw myself reflected mm -hmm. in parts of this story and it, it was wonderful to be able to see that. Thank you so much for saying that. It, it means a lot and I am, I, I'm super honored that this was one of my first talks and um, I really honestly really want to go back to Wisconsin. I think there's so much there and, and so I'm super grateful for the space. Oh, well, we would love to have you back. <laughs> okay. Um. On that note, I'm about to go catch my plane. Yep. Hey, so I'm not stuck in, in this um in this lounge. But um but thank you so much, Angela and Connor. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Paula, for being here. Thank you, Angela, for your wonderful questions. Um, Paula, open invitation. Once you can come back and we can gather all together, we'd love to have you back. Uh, perhaps right. for this book, perhaps for another book, whichever whatever <laughs> comes first. But um, okay. Thank you so much for this. We hope that you will um, go and purchase Paula's book from our bookselling partners at A Room One's Own. Um, Paula, be safe. Travel home safely. Um, we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.